cover of the architectural plan. Human exploration of Mars. Uh, it was announced in 2004. The report was issued publicly a few years later. This is online. You can go to nasa.gov, look under Humans to Mars. You can download this report and, and get the whole blueprint. This is the front cover of the book. Uh, we can see this is a mobility system to take astronauts around the surface. This is one of the habitats. And this is the back cover uh, of, of, this, uh, of this report. And it shows something very important. It shows the rocket that will take the astronauts after 500 days on the surface. <laughs> this rocket will take, will blast off from the surface of Mars and bring them to a Mars orbiting uh, vehicle and they'll rendezvous and then they'll come back to Earth. Now, uh, when they had, when it was announced in 2004 that there would be, as a national goal, sending humans to Mars, big, big press conference, about 500 reporters in Washington, and uh, someone asked the president who announced it, and that was George Bush in 2004, uh, someone asked uh, the uh, president, why are we sending humans to Mars? And uh, Bush said, well, I don't know, but the NASA administrator knows, I'm sure. Well, the NASA administrator said he didn't know. And so what happened, Oops. Uh, he, he had, was very short-lived. He, uh, he, he actually was one of the few NASA administrators. He had been working in the Bureau of the Budget and was appointed to head NASA. He's not a scientist or an engineer. But, but he was uh, good enough to immediately form a committee to look into the question, why are we sending humans to Mars? And uh, I was asked to co-chair that committee, and we were told we could get up to 30 people, Mars scientists from all around the world, uh, Jim Garvin, uh, NASA scientist, and I co-chaired, and we got a committee that represented the uh, European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency. We worked for about five years, and then we wrote a report. That report is the first uh, three chapters of this report, giving the justification for why we want to send humans to Mars. But we had so much material that we published a 976-page book that outlines the whole uh, trip to Mars and how you colonize the red planet. I, I did this with uh, Rudy Schilt, who's a professor of astrophysics at Harvard. So what I want to spend some time on is I want to tell you about planet Mars, then I want to tell you why humans, and uh, then I want to show you a video of an artist's conception of what this trip will look like. When it, when it happens. This is a photograph uh, of what planet Mars looks like. This is a composite of several photographs taken in 1976 by the Viking Orbiter. Viking was a project at the NASA Island Research Center here in Hampton. And uh, in the summer of 1975, we launched two spacecraft to Mars. Each spacecraft had an orbiter to orbit Mars, and each orbiter contained a lander. And on July 20th, 1976, for the first time in human history, we landed successfully on the surface of a planet, and that was, that was Mars, and that was the Viking uh, experiment. This is the first color picture we took in 1976. Uh, Viking Land won the first color image of Mars, and in fact, Mars is a red planet. Earth is the third planet from the sun. Mars is the fourth planet from the sun. The Earth's about 93 million miles from the sun. Mars is about 150 million 
miles. So Mars is 150 mm -hmm. million miles from the sun, we're 93 million. But when we do this mission to, to Mars, a human mission, we're going to travel about 150 million miles because the Earth is moving and Mars is moving. And let me show you the comparison of the size of Earth and Mars. You can clearly see that Earth is about twice the size of planet Mars. But here's an interesting fact. The surface area on Earth and Mars are about the same. That's because two-thirds of the Earth is covered by ocean. And so Mars, even though it's half the size, has as much surface area to explore as planet Earth does. So there's a lot to see on Mars. Now, we, we, we know a lot about planet Mars because we've sent a lot of robotic missions to Mars. Uh, about 15 years ago, we sent a mission called Mars Global Surveyor, Mark developed at NASA. Mars Global Surveyor had a laser system, and, and basically what the laser system does is it sends high-intensity light from the spacecraft it hits the surface of Mars, and then a, uh, the light comes back, bounces back to space, and the instrument has a telescope to collect that light. Now, you collect the light that you was the laser sent to the surface of Mars, and you can measure it to better than a millionth of a second, and you can determine the topography, the elevation of the Mars surface. So what I want to show you is a series of topographic maps of Mars. Uh, it turns out we probably know the topography, the elevation, the surface elevation uh, of Mars better than we know of Earth. And that's because two-thirds of the Earth is covered by ocean. So this is, this is a typical uh, image. Now, you see different colors. And what those colors represent are different elevations. If it's blue, it's about five miles below mean sea level. Five miles below mean sea level. Now you're thinking to yourself, well that's strange because there's no sea on Mars. So how do we talk about sea level? But assuming Mars is a perfect geometric sphere, if it's a, a blue color, it's about five miles below, if it's a uh, yellow color, it's about 12 miles above mean sea level. And you notice you see, you see four dots, one, two, three, four. Those are volcanic craters. And in fact, these are the four largest volcanoes in the solar system. This is Olympus Mons. You also see, uh, a depression, a canyon. This is actually Valles Marineris. This is the biggest, this is the Grand Canyon of Mars. It's 3,000 miles long. And on this and subsequent pictures, you'll see the surface of Mars is highly cratered. If it's a, a reddish color, that means it's about three miles above the mean sea level, and so on. So, I want to talk about Mars by showing you the topographic maps. And on this, looking, oh, and there, there's a polar cap right here that's frozen water and frozen carbon dioxide. Mars is 95% carbon dioxide. And there's a polar cap at the North Pole and there's a polar cap at the South Pole. And the polar cap is frozen water surrounded by frozen carbon dioxide. So there are polar caps at each, uh, at each pole. This is a Viking picture of Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. This is bigger than the state of Arizona. This is uh, a, a, an image. This, this image shows uh, Valles Marineris, and here is superimposed on the picture is a map of the continental United States. See how big this, this thing is. Now, now we rotated Mars.
Mars is about 100 degrees, or, or Mars rotated, and we're looking at another, another, another view. And, and what, what we're looking at, among other things, is this big blue area in the southern hemisphere. This is called Hellas Basin. Hellas Basin is 3,000 miles across. And Hellas Basin is a crater five miles deep that formed when an asteroid struck Mars and formed this crater. If you were on Mars that day, it wasn't a good day. <laughs> but what I want you to see is craters all over Mars. And those craters are material from asteroids and meteors. This is leftover material, solid material, when the solar system formed 4.7 billion years ago. It's leftover material. And that's important because in a minute I'm going to talk to you about uh, impacts that the Earth and other planets may experience. So, so this is another area that's of interest, Hellas Basin. We're now looking at the northern hemisphere of Mars. Here's the north, I'm sorry, here's the northern polar cap. The northern polar cap. And notice in the northern hemisphere, you see two interesting things. Most of the northern hemisphere is five miles below mean sea level. You know that because it's blue. But also, the other interesting thing is that there are no craters in that blue area in this region, the northern hemisphere. You don't see any impact craters. Well, that surprised geologists for a number of years. And about 10 years ago, my, my colleague, Jim Head, who is a professor of planetary science at Brown University said, well, it's obvious. This was the location of the early ocean on Mars. And when Mars formed, this region, which covers about uh, two thirds of the northern hemisphere, was an ocean. It was five miles deep. And today, there is no liquid water on the surface of Mars. Something happened on Mars that caused the ocean to disappear, rivers to disappear, and lakes to disappear. Now, let me tell you some interesting things about Mars that we've learned. What we're looking at is uh, a magnetic field that's in the southern hemisphere of Mars. This is when Mars Global Surveyor was at 400 kilometers, that's about 250 miles. It carried an instrument called a magnetometer, and it measured uh, the magnetic field. If it's blue, it's a magnetic field facing into the planet. If it's red, it's facing out. And we were really surprised that there was a strong magnetic field in the crust. It's a million times stronger than the magnetic field we have in the Earth's crust. Then we dropped the altitude from 400 kilometers to 100 kilometers and made high resolution measurements and mapped out the magnetic field. So it's still a mystery. Why is there such a strong magnetic field uh, in the crust of Mars? These are some Viking pictures look, look, that, that were taken in 76 to 1982. Look at this feature. We think this is a dried out riverbed. It looks like an erosional feature of a river that was here and eroded this, the, the crust. And look, look at these pictures. These look like streamlines. Like you have an island surrounded by fast flowing water. So beginning with Viking in 1976, we, we began making measurements of features on Mars that appeared to be uh, produced by water erosion, although there's no water on Mars, liquid water today. These are more recent pictures of features. 
In fact, this picture was taken from a Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity that finally died on Wednesday after 14 years of the surface of Mars. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And this is on the edge of a, of a crater, what appears to be water remnants. This, in some ways, is my favorite Mars picture. This is a photograph of Mars, and what we're looking at is an ice skating rink in the middle of this <laughs> crater. And this is ice, and it's thick, you can skate on it. And it's because the sun never hits this region because of the geometry of the crater where it's located. So there is no liquid water on Mars, but we have evidence of frozen water on Mars. Uh, James Head, the one who proposed the Northern Hemisphere was the site of the early ocean on Mars, uh, goes to Antarctica and does research. And this is a photograph he took in Antarctica. This is a photograph that we took uh, of Olympus Mons, the big volcano on Mars. And he says that the structure of both of these features are the same, so that we, there, there's a lot of features on Mars, geology of Mars, that we see on Earth. Most of the water on the surface of Mars is in the North Polar Cap and the South Polar Cap, and uh, it's several hundred feet deep. And as I mentioned, there is frozen water surrounded by frozen carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a major gas in the atmosphere. It's 95% by volume. Uh, so this is the polar cap, and a few years ago we put up a satellite around Mars, um, it, and it's called Odyssey, and what Odyssey did is measure how much frozen water, frozen water, there is below the surface, and this shows a map of Mars, if it's purple, like here, uh, we're talking about 64% of the crustal material is water. If it's yellow, it's 4%. So below the surface of Mars, there's a lot of water. And uh, that's good when we send humans to Mars because the water begins a few inches below the surface. So all the astronauts will have to do is melt it and they'll be able to drink it. Of all the measurements we made of Mars uh, over the last few decades, I think the most interesting and the most provocative measurements we obtained are shown here. What we're looking at in red and green is the gas methane, CH4, methane. Now what's interesting about methane, there's some methane in the Earth's atmosphere it's about two parts per million, so it's very, very low. But what's interesting is that 99% of the methane on our planet is produced by life. Life, microscopic life, produces methane as a metabolic byproduct. And so here, a group of astronomers headed by Mike Moma at the Goddard Space Flight Center discovered a region on Mars, three distinct regions, where methane is being produced. And it turns out methane is produced only during the summer. And then in the fall and winter, it, it's not being produced. So every summer we see methane being produced on Mars, gets in the atmosphere, and uh, uh, a year later, when summer, it's summertime again, it starts all over again. And as I said, I think this is very important because I think this is the strongest evidence that we have that there is some sort of microbial life on planet Mars. And uh, that's very exciting. Now what I've done here is I have plotted uh, the astronomers who uh, discovered this, Mike Moma, who's a good friend of mine, calls this region A, uh, B1, 
and B2. Very creative names <laughs> for this. And, and what I did is I plotted the areas, this area A is here, uh, B1 is here, uh, B2 here, on a map of Mars crust. And it turns out that we've dated the whole crust on Mars through a method I, I don't have time to talk about. But the methane is being produced each year over the oldest part of Mars, the original crust. The original crust that was on the surface when Mars formed 4.7 billion years ago. Most of Mars has been reworked, the surface. We've had volcanoes, so a lot of regions are covered by volcanoes, by volcanic lava. We've had impact craters, uh, and, and that will happen once the crust was formed. But each of these regions is what we call primordial Mars crust. Now, we have landed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spacecraft on the surface of Mars. Seven. Let me point out, it's not a trivial task to land a spacecraft, salt land, a spacecraft on Mars. And Viking 1 was the first, was the first successful uh, salt landing, and uh, Uh, let's see, Viking 1 is here, then a few months later, Viking 2, then we had something called uh, Mars Pathfinder in 1997. This is Mars Exploration uh, Opportunity, Mars Exploration uh, Rover Spirit, uh, Phoenix in 2008, and here is Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity. Notice most of uh, the spacecraft that we've landed on Mars are in the Northern Hemisphere. And in the Northern Hemisphere, in general, the terrain is lower. I, I mean, it's bad, you know, you know this is five miles below mean sea level. Because when you go to Mars, when you enter Mars' atmosphere, you're traveling at 18,000 miles an hour. And in seven minutes, you have to go from 18,000 miles an hour to one or two miles an hour mm. so you can successfully land. That's called entry, descent, and landing. And uh, if, you don't, if you don't slow up from 18,000 miles to one or two miles per hour, you form another crater on Mars. <laughs> the Russians have done that more than two dozen times. The European Space Agency has done that several times. But at NASA Langley, we've developed a technology to successfully slow up and successfully land. And one of the interesting things is when we made the discovery of methane, uh, in fact, I'll go back. When we, when we made the discovery of these methane areas, this is oh, where wow. it would appear on, on the map. Turns out we cannot land the spacecraft at A, B1, or B2, because there's not enough Mars atmosphere above you. So that's probably the most interesting part of Mars, because there may be life there, but we can't do a robotic mission and send it there. What we can do is send a human mission, though, and have it land in any area of blue, and give the astronauts a, a car and have them drive there. And that's exactly what we're doing. Why Mars? Why do we want to send astronauts to Mars? Well, I've already told you the reasons. The first is there's past and or present life on Mars. And, uh, and as I mentioned, the discovery of life on Mars that formed on Mars would, uh, would be a tremendous boom to biology. Now, every mission that we send to Mars, every mission must be sterilized. In fact, I have someone sitting in the front row who worked for Bionetics that had, raise your hand, that had the contract to sterilize Viking. 
and about one fifth of the price of the Mars mission is due to sterilization of ultraviolet radiation and heat. So we're hoping, we're hoping that uh, we have killed all of the microbes on the surface of uh, that we're that on the spacecraft we sent. Unfortunately, no one told Elon Musk about this because of three years ago on his Dragon rocket, Elon Musk launched a red Tesla. Remember that? <laughs> and with, with the dummy sitting on the front seat. Well, that's very nice, but someone at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena did a calculation. Within 500 years, that red Tesla may collide with planet Mars, and it will bring a, a tremendous number of Earth microbes to the surface. There was an international agreement signed by the space agencies of all countries, uh, in 20 countries, and uh, I guess that uh, Elon Musk didn't hear about that, uh, that, that treaty. The second thing, problem, what happened on Mars? What caused the catastrophic climate change? What made Mars go from an Earth-like planet with liquid water and a thick atmosphere to a very inhospitable planet? Now, we, we, we believe the, there was a huge ocean on Mars in its early history, and how can we find out what happened on Mars over its history? Well, a lot of us think that that answer is in ice cores at the North Pole and South Pole. On Earth, we reconstructed the whole climate history of the Earth by studying atmospheric samples that are trapped in ice. You, bring, you, you take an ice core and uh, bring it in the laboratory, melt it under vacuum conditions, have an instrument called a mass spectrometer. You actually measure the gases that are absorbed in this ice core. And it's done routinely on Earth. And we know that there are ice cores on Mars at the North Pole and South Pole. And so the whole climate history of Mars may be written at the, at the poles. We looked, when our committee met uh, for five years, we looked at what robotic missions can do uh, based on our predicted developments in technology. And what our committee unanimously concluded is that no robotic mission can drill 100 feet, bring up a core, and handle it correctly without a human in the loop on the ground. So we don't think there's a robotic mission that can do this. And that's one of the things we think that humans can do quite well. And this will be one of the first targets when humans get to Mars. <laughs> now, here's the question, why humans? Why not robotic mission? Well, you know one reason, that some scientific measurements are too sophisticated for a robotic mission. But let me show you some of the qualities that humans possess, including the humans sitting in this room. Intelligence, ingenuity, adaptability, agility, dexterity, mobility, and speed and efficiency. And that's not true of a robotic mission. In fact, one of the, one of the most important things about exploring another planet is mobility. And uh, the record for travel outside of the Earth on another planet was held by opportunity. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Mobility is very important. On March 25, 2015, NASA's Opportunity rover celebrated a Mars marathon. It covered 26.2 miles, but it took 11 years. <laughs> now, since, since March 25th, 2015, until it finally died uh, earlier this year, it did two more miles. So Opportunity holds the record for a rover 
of traveling 28 miles. What, we're, what, what we've planned for a human mission is a vehicle, uh, a mobility system, a car, that can travel hundreds of miles a day. So this is what we're going to send when the astronauts go to Mars, a mobility system. We can become a two-planet species, and, and, and the question, there, there are a lot of implications about this, but let me, let me talk about one aspect of this. Every year, there's an international conference that talks about the future of life on our planet. And every year, there's a list of 25 things that worry people who study this. And they're always the same three. And I want to tell you what they are. The first is catastrophic climate change. That something may happen on Earth to cause the Earth uh, to become uninhabitable. Now, I don't know what that is, but I know it happened on Mars. Mars lost 99% of its atmosphere, and Mars lost all its liquid water. So climate change, catastrophic climate change, is a concern. Now, we're worried about the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that result has resulted in a temperature increase since the mid-1800s, a global temperature increase, an average temperature several degrees. What we're talking about now is some rapid uh, catastrophic event that would cause the Earth's climate to change, uh, either go up or down, that uh, we, 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 we can't predict. So that's number one on the list. The second is synthetic biology experiments or a, nat or a, a natural epidemic. Uh, there are Experiments being conducted in the United States and Russia and China and probably 20 other countries of using human-produced microorganisms and viruses as a potential tool of war, weapon of war. And uh, many people are very, very concerned about that. And the third threat to life on the planet is cosmic impact. And I want to talk about cosmic impacts because it's a question of not is it going to happen, it's a question of when it's going to happen. And let, let me just point out one or two things. 65 million years ago, a large object that may have been 50 miles across hit the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and led to the extinction of dinosaurs all over the planet. The dinosaurs were the, uh, uh, the major form of life on this planet for a long time, and in one catastrophic event, an impact of a small asteroid, like, well, let's say small, 50 miles across, it made a crater several hundred miles across, and uh, there was just a Nova TV program weeks ago on, on this event. Let me talk about something closer to home. 35 million years ago, a five mile long object, asteroid, <coughs> formed the Chesapeake Bay. The Chesapeake Bay crater was formed 35 million years ago when an impact object uh, uh, hit the Earth. Uh, more recently, We've had some very, very near misses uh, of asteroids. In fact, uh, the most recent was in 2015, an asteroid came within 3.1 times the distance of the Earth to the moon. This is considered a cosmic near miss, and the calculations show that in subsequent years, on time scales of hundreds of years, this object may actually hit the Earth. Uh, this object was about 1,100 feet across, and it was massive enough to have its own moon. So this is a photograph of the object, and this is its moon. So it's just a matter of time, and, and, and you know, the question is where, where it hits and what its impact is. Now let me show you an interesting video 
Uh, that was taken from a Cam Coy reporter. Oh, look, before we do that, this is, I'm going to show you what show up now that I have specially made. And it plots the asteroids in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And every green object is an asteroid that are 100 feet across to 500 miles across. And they go around the sun. And uh, let's see if we can even count them. Uh, here's the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, here's Jupiter. Each object, green object, is an asteroid. If it's red, it crosses the Earth's orbit. Millions of more asteroids are still to be mapped out. Now, it turns out about three years ago in Siberia, uh, in the morning, uh, someone was driving to work and had his camcorder on. This is an asteroid entering Siberia. It caused damage to thousands of buildings uh, all over the area in Siberia. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's conclude with a quote by Stephen Hawking, probably one of the most brilliant minds dealing with the origin and evolution of the universe, who, who passed away uh, several months ago. And Hawking has written. I think the human race has no future if it does not go into space. And, and by going into space, we mean records of the earth, our books, our music, our art. We, we have to make sure it's preserved. And uh, maybe the place to have everything preserved, as well as the human race, is on Mars. Let me show you a video that was made especially for this talk. And uh, what you're going to see is the new space launch system that's being built by NASA just to get humans to Mars on its first test run. It's a real video, and then everything else is our, an artist's conception of how we'll get to Mars and how we'll get back. Three, two, one, and liftoff at dawn, the dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. This is three years ago at the Kennedy Space Center, the most powerful rocket called the Space Launch System. This really happened. Then the human uh, occupants rendezvous with the, here, the humans are in here. This is called the Orion capsule with a transfer vehicle. The transfer vehicle takes the humans to, uh, to Mars, uh, entering the Mars atmosphere. We have entry, descent, and landing. This is how we land on the surface of Mars. Then when we, when we land, uh, astronauts will spend 500 days on the surface. They'll look for life. They'll look for, for the reasons the climate of Mars changed so much. Then after they're finished, this is part of the material equipment they brought. This is a rocket that will take them back to Mars orbit. They'll run the boom with an orbiting Mars vehicle and come back to Earth. So the, the question is, uh, when this happens, uh, originally NASA thought we will put the first uh, human mission in operation in 2033. Right now, that's still the date, but th there may be some things on the horizon. And the way this will work is there'll be two rocket launches to Mars. Uh, each of the rockets will carry 135 tons of equipment, food, medicine, uh, water, gen electrical generators. The trip takes nine months, and both, both rockets have to land 
within 10 miles of each other on the surface of Mars. Then once we know that the cargo ships are safely on the surface, we'll send the human mission. Right now, up until a few months ago, it was six astronauts. Now we're thinking about four uh, because it's easier, you need less material. And that human mission will land within 10 miles of the two cargo missions that are now on the surface of Mars, and will begin the human exploration of Mars. That will last for 500 days, and uh, at the end of 500 days, they'll take their little rendezvous rocket engine, climb in the spacecraft on the surface, rendezvous with the astronaut that's been orbiting Mars for 500 days, probably nothing to do but take pictures of the surface, and then they'll start their nine-month trip back to planet Earth. So that's the architecture. We believe, we believe that there are no technological problems that we, we can't overcome. The equipment has been built. The, the command module called the Orion module is nearing completion. The space launch system, the most powerful rocket ever built, is, uh, I, in fact, I saw it two years ago. I went down to where it's being built, and it's, it's amazing, bigger, bigger than the Statue of Liberty. So the technology is, is, will be ready. The main question is, the human, uh, the humans on the mission, being on a mission for nine months each way, then 500 days on Mars, then, five, then, then nine months back. When we did the Apollo missions, the total trip was Apollo missions, as you know, was to the moon. That's uh, two and a half days each way. They stayed five days. So you can see this is a big increase, although we've had astronauts on the International Space Station now for over a year, and they're learning about the effect of what you know, no, no gravity, weightlessness, and it's of impact on the human body. You lose some uh, bone material, you have some problems with your eye. Uh, we're learning about them from the International Space Station, but it appears now there is no showstopper. We think we can handle the radiation. My friend Steve Walter, a NASA engineer sitting in the front row, who every time I see him, he talks to me about radiation effects on, on the, on the nine-month trip, and he's right. We think there are some ways to overcome that. It looks like, from a technological point of view, we can do it. And I think from a medical perspective, we can do it. And if, when we do it, it will be the first time in human history, or the first time, in, yeah, probably the first, first time in human history that humans become a two-planet species. And that's be very, very exciting. So that's what we're planning to do. I want to thank you for your patience and for sitting here. And I think we have time for some questions. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Levine, you know, we're talking now 14 years down the road for the mission to, to happen. I, NASA, I, we know, is working on all sorts of advantages, uh, all sorts of advances in propulsion. I mean, are we not anticipating the idea that we can shorten that 18 month transfer uh, time to? Yeah, that's a very good question. The question is, why aren't we using some new revolutionary form of propulsion to take us to the planets? And the reason, I think the reason is, is very simple. There's something called the technical readiness level. And NASA says that if it involves a human, you have to have a, a, a technical ready, a readiness level of 10. That means you can do it, you've demonstrated it, and there'll be no problems. 
And when it comes to human life, NASA has made the decision not to put new technology, unproven technology, in any mission, especially a human mission. So I agree with you. You, you know, the, um, the space shuttle that was finally retired in 2011, the first flight was, the first flight was 1981, uh, the first flight of the, of, the, uh, of the space shuttle. That had technology that you have in your pocket if you have a modern smartphone. Your computer in your pocket is better than the astronauts had on that shuttle mission. And in fact, one of the reasons the shuttle was, uh, uh, was, was discontinued is because the technology had advanced and, and you, you couldn't gamble sending humans in 30-year-old technology. So what, what, the question you're asking is a very good question. What about new technology? And it's not going to happen as long as it involves humans on a mission. Good question. Any? Yes, back there. Things that we 
we, we haven't anticipated. First of all, nine months is a long time. I, I, w when we finish this report on sending humans to Mars, um, I, I was asked to present it to the astronauts, the astronaut office at Johnson Space Center. And I presented all of our results. And I asked them, I said, how many of you after hearing all this would like to go on that first mission? And everyone raised their hands. I also asked another question. I said, what happens if it's a one-way trip? It's not, it's a round trip. But if it's a one-way trip, all of them raised their hands again. And that's probably because their supervisors were sitting there. <laughs> but, uh, but I, just two years ago, NASA, NASA asked me to prepare a workshop on some of the medical effects of humans going to Mars. And we had a three-day meeting, and we, we had medical doctors, we had engineers, scientists, sat around for, for, three, uh, uh, for three days. We, we, we did a detailed study, and, and we had it in Houston, where the astronauts are at a laboratory called Lunar Planetary Laboratory. And the astronauts came over and participated in the meeting. And I think from our knowledge, we have a good understanding. Now, the, the, the problem is what we don't understand. But uh, I think that with some, with some level of confidence, we can say it will be successful. If we couldn't say it would be successful, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't go ahead with the mission. Now, now the reason the shuttle, space shuttle, was, was terminated in 2011, and, and that, that was not a great thing. When we canceled the space shuttle in 2011, uh, we had no way to get back to the International Space Station. And what NASA, what NASA did is signed a contract with Russia. Russia has a Soyuz spacecraft, and uh, Russia said they would bring U.S. astronauts to the International Space Station and bring them back for $20 million a, a person. Well, because we have no other way, that price is now up to $100 million a person. So, the, you know, Russians uh, learned about capitalism, even though it's a socialist uh, society. We're having a new flight, the second flight of the space launch system later this year. And I think within two years, it will be certified to carry humans. And this, this is an amazing instrument. So in answer to your question, the things we know about, we can compensate for. It's what we don't know about. Yes. Second question is yes, there'll be men and women traveling to Mars. And in terms of the first question, the International Space Station is international. And, and we have right now, we have Russians up there, we have Europeans, we've had representatives from about a dozen countries. But each country contributed something important to the International Space Station, a, a part of the space station was built uh, by, by different countries. That's because uh, we, we, we needed the money and we needed the support. So far, as of February 17, 2019, the whole development of the Humans to Mars program, the Space Launch System, the Orion Command Module, all of, everything we're doing is solely done by US scientists and engineers. So there is no international participation in this mission other than the US. And, and one of the reasons is that uh, for national security, uh, it, it, it's very sophisticated engineering, very sophisticated instrumentation, and uh, NASA made the decision that they will develop this system with US participation. 
Now, there are many contractors, uh, Lockheed Martin and Boeing and Grumman, and, and about uh, a thousand other contractors that have a piece of the action, but it's all done by U.S. companies and U.S. citizens. And, and in fact, you, you, you have to undergo an investigation before you're hired in these companies. Yes? Good question. Is there anything that can account for the presence of methane on Mars other than living systems producing it? And, and the answer is yes, because during volcano uh, emissions, during volcano volcanic explosions, we measure methane as a very minor constituent of volcanoes coming coming from the interior of the planet. But if you measure methane, you always measure sulfur dioxide and a whole bunch of other gases, and we haven't done it in the Mars case. So it's possible there's, there may be some methane in the interior of the planet that gets out during volcanic eruptions. I don't think it's likely because we don't measure the other volcanic gases. And the other thing is, this only happens during the summer. And we all know that's when the surface heats up and my, and my microbial activity probably begins in earnest then. I actually think that um, it's biogenic, it's produced by living systems. Uh, up until a year ago, the NASA's chief scientist, his name is, is, was Ellen Stofan. Ellen Stofan is a graduate of the College of William and Mary, and she was the chief scientist of NASA. And she has publicly stated that she thinks in the next five years we will have unambiguous evidence that there is life on Mars. I, I think it would be more astounding if the Earth is the only planet in the solar system or the only place with life. Yes. self-sustaining, and I think the answer is yes. And, and I think that a, a very interesting thing is that there are at least a half a dozen companies right now that are planning to send humans to Mars. Uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk's company, um, uh, it is one that's made great, great strides. But when he launches a launch vehicle, the boosters that cost about $100 million each comes back to Earth and lands upright on a barge in the ocean or can land at the, at the launch site. NASA doesn't have that technology. I think over the next decade, we're going to see a tremendous movement from industry. I, I've seen plans that Boeing has for sending humans Lockheed has, uh, and Grumman. They, they all have their own missions and their own equipment. I think we're gonna see a tremendous increase in commercial participation in this. I, I, think, I think we can have a self-sustaining community of humans on the surface of Mars. But, but it's not only, it's not only uh, humans, we want to safeguard the treasures of the earth, our great books, our great artwork, and we want to we want a second place to put this stuff. And uh, you, you know, when we have an asteroid, asteroids hit massive objects. Earth is more than ten times more massive than Mars because Mars Mars is much smaller. 
So if an asteroid has its choice of Earth or Mars, gravity says it's going to kick her. Okay, I think maybe maybe like two more questions so sure. we can avoid the collision of the middle school students <laughs> with the Mars group. So. <laughs> is there a plan to return samples back to the Earth from Mars? And if there is, what is the plan to prevent bringing something back that they don't want to return to Earth? <laughs> that is a that, that's an excellent question. The question is. Uh, is there a plan to bring samples of Mars back to Earth? And if so, how do we make sure we don't bring a microbe or a virus back from Mars? Remember the book Andromeda Strain? Well, it's funny you ask that. Now, I, this is a gentleman who is involved in the sterilization of Viking. We're working, working for Bionetics Corporation. It turns out that my second Mars book that came out about three months ago addresses that question. And, and, and the question is, how do we ensure that there are no microbes or microorganisms or viruses that are brought back to Earth that can cause problems on Earth? The answer is the International Space Station. That becomes our quarantine facility. So when, when humans come back, and when we bring rocks back from Mars for, this, for the Mars sample return, they go to the International Space Station, where we, if we, we have a quarantine for three months, or six months, or nine months, and only when, there's, when, when we know they're safe do they come back to Earth. So that'll be, that'll be a good goal for the International Space Station. Yes, Robert. Uh, we talked about materials, uh, ships, etc. What about the people? What is being done to ensure that the staff of this, this adventure are compatible and being able to be together <laughs> alone for, for four years? Um. That, that's a good question. The question is, how, how do we come up with a compatible crew so they don't kill each other? Um, <laughs> it, it turns out that when my wife, Arlene, who's sitting, Arlene, raise your hand, when she worked in the International Space Station office, that was her job to, uh, to find out about compatible crews. It turns out that not only do they undergo very strong medical testing, but they also undergo very strong psychological testing. And, um, and th there's a high level of certainty. By the time the crew is chosen, we will have a compatible crew. So there is a lot of work being done on that. I mean, we, we, we're just not randomly picking four people, putting them on a space trip. No, Robert, are you volunteering? Yeah. No. Well, listen, I want to thank you all. You're a great